Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. This time it is a review of Dr. Sleep, the sequel to The Shining. Now, I never read the novel. This was based on Dr. Sleep, which was a sequel to the novel The Shining, which was different from Stanley Tubers' The Shining. So the movie is a weird, from what I understand, combination of the book as well as the Stanley Tubers movie because there's elements that they take from the book of course but then they had to fit it with the shiny movie because in the book the hotel was burned down at the end because the the father you know, blew it up pretty much if you watch the miniseries of Stephen Weber they they follow the book but I much prefer the Stanley Kubrick movie uh, I love the shiny with Stanley Kubrick I reviewed it for the 80s horror marathon which I'm still doing for those wondering So, you have to juggle those two things. You have to be a sequel to Stanley Tubert's film, which is a tall order, because The Shining is an all-time classic. Wonderful filmmaking by Stanley Tubert. My favorite Tubert film. My favorite performance by Jad Nicholson. It's a tall order, and I will say, if I didn't love the film, I liked it. I would say I liked the film. Didn't love it, but I liked it. Because A, the actors did their jobs well, especially Ewan McGregor. I liked Ewan McGregor as an actor. I thought he did a really nice job with this. The director, he's nowhere near Stanley Kubrick's level and didn't think he was going to be. I wouldn't say his work felt like a TV movie, but it's... I wouldn't go that far. I say like to some of his films were like on Netflix and other ventures. I do wonder if you would have gotten someone. I don't know. Not, maybe not someone to ape Stanley Kubrick's style, but maybe a little bit more of that would have been nice. The, the villain, the, the character of Rose the Hat, very good villain. She was creepy and you definitely hated her character and was waiting for her to get her comeuppance. And uh, I'm trying to see who the actress's name is. She did a wonderful job as the villain. She definitely relished her role being a villain. Rebecca Ferguson as Rose the Hat. Pretty much she's the head of this cult that search out children that have psychic powers or some something of that nature. And they feed on it to stay young and then to stay living. And Rebecca Ferguson she was in Mission Impossible Road Nation. She was in Fallout. And yeah, she did a really good job as the villain. The little girl, Kylie Curran, as Abra. She was not annoying. She wasn't irritating. She wasn't a brat. I didn't feel any SJW political agenda bullshit. It's just a movie for what it is. Telling a story. I appreciate that. Uh, Cliff Curtis, who I liked, he was in a bit role in Live Free or Die Hard. He was the main villain in Collateral Damage. He plays, I liked his character. He was a buddy of Ewan McGregor's character. I do feel that a good editor could have taken this two and a half film and made it two hours. That's one of the drawbacks of the movie. Yeah, granted, Stanley Tubers' is Shining is pretty long. But that, I didn't feel the length because of the perfect execution of music and visuals and, you know, then 
I liked Ewan McGregor, but Jack Nicholson's almost hypnotizing performance, very fun performance, uh, really just brought you into this world that I'm fine with being in that world for however long. This, definitely not on that level. So I think you could easily make this a two-hour film instead of two and a half hours. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a decent enough story, decently told, with a very solid cast. And there's nothing in it that I found creepy. I mean, some bits of the, the roles that had the, the female villain, like her acting. But other than that, like, not much... I didn't think it was that. I mean, it's a. I guess you would call it a horror film, but I didn't really feel a horror. It's a, I don't know how to put it. Maybe I'm just of the age that nothing really steers me anymore. I don't mean that to, to gloat. I just matter of fact thing. It's just hard to go into a steer movie. Just I never get scared of them anymore because real life is a lot steerier. So maybe that's that fair to the movie. But I mean, the, the gist of the story, which I actually did not expect this, but I thought this was a nice touch. Uh, it starts off <clears throat> a bit after the first movie ends. Does you do have a young Danny which I thought was a nice representation of the the Danny from the first movie. And then you have a mom playing... Uh, who Who is this actress? Because she did... She really nailed... When I saw her, I could buy her being a Shelley Duvall type. Alex O.S.O. S.O.E. as Wendy. Like the way she taught... Really remind me of Shelley Duvall to the point it was kind of spooky. It was kind of spooky. Like this actress, either they found the right girl or she really did her homework to make it sound her sound a lot like Shelley Duvall from the The Shining. Uh, I thought she you know, she did a really good job. And then you had Carl Lum Lumley as Dick Cowan. Who's the cook in the the first film, played by Stabman Crothers, and you may be wondering, well, how is he in this? He's dead. Well, he's a ghost who tossed the young Danny, and you know, there's some decent conversations in there, and also apparently some of the spirits of the Overlook still follow Danny. But I like this idea, how this is truthful to the book, I don't know. For those who read the book, you can let me know. But I like the idea where he sort of taught or teaches himself, after some advice from Halloran, to lock these things in his head, in the little box. And I like the visual look where we see like the hedge maze and these boxes, like a treasure chest. And it's it's like a better version of what they tried to do in Dreamcatcher. For those who remember Dreamcatcher, where they're in the mind and it's this fucking library bullshit. Granted, yeah, that whole movie's fucking awful, but to see and sit his head and represent the mind. This, A, was much more brief, and B, how just a better representation of that. You know, showcase of the mind, and, um, you know, to give the director credit, that's one little bit that I thought was well filmed on, on a visual level. And Ewan McGregor, like it, 
it's sort of three time points. It's one where it's somewhat after the first movie. Then it's Ewan as an adult in 2011. And he's a drunk and he's having bad times and he, he moves, you know, gets his life in order, AA meetings. And then it's eight years later. And he works at this hospital and he's known as Dr. Sleep. And that's because there's this cat. Well, I thought this was a cool idea. This white cat will go into one of the rooms and whichever room it goes to, that's when someone's about ready to die. And so Danny, you know, McGregor's character goes in and he helps the people go to sleep, ease their way who are close to dying. Not in a Dr. Gavorkian style, but just so that they're not so afraid or in pain. <clears throat> and it's helping these elderly people or sickly people in that way. Which I thought was pretty nice. And I liked that the the little kid, again, she wasn't bratty, she wasn't annoying, she wasn't irritating, she wasn't shrill, shrill voice or nails on a chalkboard type of acting. She has this gift too. It starts seeing people get killed, like this kid with baseball glove. I like that the villain... There are moments where she gets beaten up. Because in this day and age, it's like, whoa, she can't be beaten up. It's a woman. Yeah, but it's the villain. They don't do that bullshit. They, it's like in the story, this little girl is more powerful, at least at first. So she's like, fuck it, rose the hat in this dream state. And the villain's actually getting scared. So it, it gives a certain almost vulnerability to the villain not enough to, for us to care about her because the very first scene is uh, fucked up of the movie I mean when there's so many even villains being Mary Sue's it was nice to see that they're not you know, people have flaws. It was kind of uh, welcoming in a way. I don't know that the movie. I, I, yeah, I liked it. I thought it was fairly well done. I don't know if it was a sense of melancholy or a sense of. You know, one reviewer mentioned this contemplative. So I didn't really feel much of a visceral response like I would in, like compared to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining when you just saw like the typewriter and all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And, you know, that hits home. You give me the bat. Honey, Wendy, darn my life. I'm not going to hurt you. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your brains in. Go bash right the fuck in. So there's not a lot of like big visceral moments they uh, kind of missed with this movie. Again, also maybe with the two and a half hour running time and I'm saying, you know, if you do this, this, you could cut it down to two hours. Fairly easy. I think it would have been for the benefit of the movie. But also, I mean, Danny, Ewan McGregor, he's not a pushover either, which I liked. And I'm getting more into spoilers, so... Fair warning, starting now. Yeah, I like that they're in the shootout in the trees with these guys. And when they kill part of the cult, they turn the smoke. One part I didn't care for is that, and speaking of stuff that you could be cut out, they spent a good chunk of time of the villains recruiting this new person. Who makes a guy fall in sl to sleep while they're watching Casablanca and then puts like a mark on the guy's face and then rolls the hat like goes to her and invites her to be part of the cult and 
goes through this ritual, really all so that they this this scene. She's making Danny fall asleep. She gets shot by Cliff Curtis. And then before she dies, she tells Cliff Curtis to kill himself. And then Cliff Curtis kills himself. I'm thinking, one, this whole girl villain. The, I forget the I forget the character's name. That character had been completely taken out. You could have completely taken out that character. And it, it would not have made that much of a difference. And it would have shaved off chunks of the running time. Number two, she wasn't that interesting of a character, one of, you know, a side villain that made the running time worthwhile for her to be on screen. I mean, the main villain Rose to have was much more interesting than this, whoever the hell this girl is. And then third, why the fuck is she having such control over Danny Torrance, you know, McGregor's character? Because he has a similar power too. So why isn't he fighting against her or using his own shining against her? <clears throat> why isn't he doing that? Why is he fighting against the sleep bitch? You know, telling to sleep, sleep. I'm like, fight her off. Use her own shining against her. What are you doing? Which is inconsistent because in the third act, he's able to create this big hallucination where Rose the Hat is in this maze chasing the little girl and then she grabs her and says, wait a minute. When on your mind are we? No, you're not. Then she gets out and then she's like, where have you been? How did we miss you? Look at the power you have. So he obviously has power. And this is over the main villain who's supposed to be even more powerful. But yet Ewan McGregor couldn't fight the sleep bitch. And he was like getting taken down so easily. So again, that the whole thing was inconsistent. I think that one, that character could have been completely taken out. Or instead of shooting the gun, why didn't he use his shining on some of these people? I think that would have been nice too when they had the f fight in the fours. Use some of his shining on some of these folks. Whether to put their guns down or shoot each other or shoot themselves. Like, why not do that? So again, there's certain choices and, you know, that I call a sleep bitch, but I don't, what was the character's name? Snake bite, snake bite Andy, played by Emily Allen Lind. Snake, yeah, snake bite Andy. She's called snake bite because the marsh she leaves looks like a snake bite. You didn't need that character in the fucking film. C completely cut her out. At least to me, it, it just so. But I, on the flip side, I do like a moment later where the one of the bad guys, cult members, has the little girl. And Ewan McGregor, with her help, is able to possess her and starts talking through her. So the cult guy is like confused. And then Ewan McGregor and the little girl, that doesn't sound right. Possessing little girl does this and fucks up a car. So it didn't. It does show his power. And then later on. Shows a lot better than fucking Luke Skywalker and Last Jedi showing his powers. So at least, you know, this film did that a lot better than The Last Jedi did. Aside from that one stupid scene with Snape by Andy. But the, I do really like the third act when they go back to the Overlook Hotel. And, you know, they do a shot similar to the beginning of the first film. And they do an updated version of that theme that... Dun, 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 dun. And although I prefer the original music, uh, the updated version 
was pretty decent too. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, you're caught nostalgia jerked in, but this I was fine with. And I thought the the music and sound design when they're in the Overlook Hotel, I thought was on point. You do get an appearance by Jad Nicholson's character. Funny enough, played by Henry Thomas. Yes, Elliot from E.T. And I think because he worked with the director on The Haunting of Hill House. The director, Mike Flanagan. So I think that's how he got the role. And granted, Henry Thomas is not doing a Jad Nicholson impression, which... Part of me is like, I get why, because you don't want people laughing at a guy trying to be a Jad Nicholson impersonation. The other part of me is like, well, would have been better just for consistency. But they do make him look like Jad Nicholson in The Shining. And Ewan McGregor and him have a moment. Uh, not really a nice moment. Which I guess makes sense because it's the hotel spirits. The, you're not going to have a random spirit be nice when all this horrible shit's going on. <clears throat> it's not something I expected either. So I'm like, oh, okay. And he's the, the bartender. But he was bears a really striking resemblance to uh, to Jack. So that was kind of a, a fun moment. And, you know, then the, the lady arrives, puts her in the maze, and she gets her comeuppance because she's attacking Danny. Uh, and then she's like, oh, what do you have in your head? And he's like, he doesn't say this, but he's like, you don't want to know. But then he lets the ghost that he locked up, lets them out, and then they all feed on her ass. <laughs> so she gets her comeuppance. Now, I mean, I get why they did it, so it didn't bother me. They kind of do, and maybe this is how it ended in the book. But it seemed like an ode to the original ending of the novel where Danny goes into the furnace, has it start up in flame, so to burn the hotel down. And I don't know what the burning of a hotel accomplished. Because it really didn't accomplish anything. Because after that, Danny dies. But he's a ghost who's going to stick with her for a while. Just like Halloween stuck with Danny a while when he was a kid. So you and McGregor are still going to be able to talk with her and help her for a while. But then the little girl sees a ghost from the Overlook and lots it like Danny did at the beginning. So, which it made me go, then what was the point of burning the hotel down in the first place? So I... I guess it's one of those scenes where I did made me go, well... Burning the hotel down didn't really accomplish anything. So why burn it down in the first place? If someone knows the question that I answer, please let me know. So that's what I mean. I like the film, but there's just some issues that I had that made me not love it. But I, I, yeah, I would call it a good... For a movie that's a sequel to The Shining, A Tall Order... There's a lot of ways it could have been fucked up and way, way worse. This is a pretty damn decent, you know, good flick. You know, it's for the most part, you know, well-directed, 
nowhere near Tubert's level. Didn't, didn't think he would be. But uh, you do tell there's respect to it. You know, solid acting. Ewan McGregor does a really good job. As does the Re Rebecca Ferguson as the villain. Little girl wasn't annoying, irritating. The it was fun to go back to the Overlook Hotel. There's some decent visuals, but again, enough up to Tubert. Which again, it's kind of unfair because that many are, but. It's still a sequel to The Shining. It's hard to not mention that. I mean, little moments I mentioned, like the scene, the early Danny and the early, you know, Wendy and the actors doing their jobs with that. Seeing a bit more of Danny and Halloran having conversations with each other. The idea that Danny growing up would help Elderly and sick people ease their way to the other world, hence the nickname Dr. Sleep. Almost wish we could have seen more of that. But yeah, I do think this is a movie that, like I said, could have been shortened to two hours. If you took out that stupid snake bag Andy little subplot thing of finding her, recruiting her, her fuck it up, you and McGregor, even though how, why is she able to do this? It's stupid and, you know, that would have shaved off a chunk of the running time. And then the very end, the fact that burning down the hotel didn't really accomplish anything kind of left a little bit I mean it's not a bad taste but a little bit of a bitter taste like oh that was pointless I mean they defeated the Rose the Hat but again the whole burn in the hotel didn't do jack shit so I mean I guess no one else would go to that hotel and deal with it Maybe that was the accomplishment, but if that was what they were intended, I don't think they really told it that well. See, I mean, I wouldn't say I was disappointed in the film. I don't know if I was hoping for not more action, because it's not about action with these movies, but I don't know if it just wasn't as grandiose or... I think that's the thing that I was thinking it was going to have more of that visceral impact of Tubert's film, since it's a continuation of that. But I just felt a little bit more melancholy than I expected. But yeah, it's a decent enough story. Good villain. Good you know, job by Ewan McGregor. Some decent usage, usage of visuals, like I mentioned. You know, Cats worked well. The whole, you know, lock up the ghosts in his mind in these chests. The seeing stuff like the Overlook Hotel, the, the hedge maze. The way that is incorporated into the film was nice. Overall, yeah, it was a pretty decent flick. I don't see myself watching it again. Don't see myself picking it up on Blu-ray or anything. Unless it's dirt cheap. I don't, I'm... You go in with low expectations, open mind, and uh, it's worth a watch. You know, I I do think it's a good flick, not a great flick, but I do think it's a pretty decent flick. But that's just my opinion. But anyway, it's a hell of a lot better than It Chapter Two. That's another way I'm coming from. I saw It Chapter Two. And that was a piece of shit. This is nowhere. This is. Tubers is shining compared to It Chapter 2. Like, of the Stephen King stuff, this is a much better, more satisfying picture than, than that. So either way, thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.